And now to give us an exclusive update on the ongoing fight against COVID-19 in Lagos State is the Commissioner for Health, Lagos State, Professor Aki Abayomi. Many thanks for joining us, Commissioner. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Right, going straight into this, I'd like to ask your opinion of the release on a, a, possible, a possible vaccine from Russia. Would you see this as a good news? Yes, <clears throat> I think um, modern technology is able to uh, rapidly escalate a search for vaccines. Um, vaccines are very important in the light of a novel pathogen, a, a new pathogen where we've not experienced something of this nature before and it's causing pandemic potential, then the only way to really protect your community is with very strict uh, social distancing or non-pharmaceutical interventions while we search for a cure and, un and understand how the disease causes pathology and death. Uh, in the absence of that, we can rely on what's typically called herd immunity where uh, a large proportion of the people in your community have developed some degree of uh, immunity to the, to the infection. And then failing that would be uh, the artificial way of um, establishing herd immunity, which is through vaccination. So vaccination basically um, tricks the body into thinking that the, it's seen the infection and therefore develops an immune system against it so that when you do encounter the pathogen uh, that you are able to resist it and it doesn't cause a life-threatening condition in the person. So normally it takes about three to four years to develop an effective vaccine because you have to go through animal studies and then transition to human studies and those human studies are divided into phase one, phase two and phase three. And then even after phase three and you get approval from your drug agencies, you still need to do another year or two of uh, post immunization or post utilization safety studies. Now, in the light of a pandemic like this, we have been able to collapse that time frame to about six to nine months, uh, which is really um, testament to the advancement of technology around the world. Uh, but there are still obviously safety concerns because a vaccine is what's injected into you. And if we don't know the long term consequences of that vaccine, uh, we can, you know, we can pose some degree of danger to our community. So it's, it's very important that we weigh up the risk of uh, widespread utilization of a new vaccine without extensive knowledge of what um, possible adverse effects that vaccine can have on the population. All right, so still on that Russian vaccine. I think how it's soon? a very positive move okay. by uh, global scientists. Fantastic. So how soon should Nigerians be expecting the benefits of this vaccine? Well, once, once a vaccine has been tested and proven to have some degree of immunological impact, then, you know, it's up to the various countries around the world to subject it to some kind of clinical trial within the environment. Remember that people around the world respond differently to medical uh, interventions, either drugs or vaccines. So there's no way of telling that if a vaccine is effective in, in, in Russia or in China, it will have the same effect in, in Africa. So while we may be able to um, translocate those findings to a different environment, you still have to do some um, scientific analysis to see that you are getting the same impact in your environment. And at the same time, look for safety profiles and make sure that that vaccine doesn't have any adverse effects amongst your population. Indeed. Now, you're quoted in July as saying that uh, the Lagos State may experience its peak by August, and it's August now. And uh, why are we then relaxing lockdown measures in the states, or reopening churches, uh, schools so to write exams and all of that? So if you look at um, the demographic profile of an outbreak, by the time you've reached your peak, you've probably infected a large number of people in that environment and therefore the virus is running out of um, potential candidates to infect. So when, when, a, when an outbreak has peaked, 
um, then after that it plateaus out and then it starts to decrease. So that's the moment at which you can start to consider relaxing your, your, your uh, lockdown strategies in the interest of opening up the economy. And, you know, when you're trying to address a public health crisis, you have to be mindful that you're not replacing it with an economic crisis, which could be just as deadly, if not more impactful on your environment so that you don't disrupt people's livelihoods and cause other un uh, consequential uh, complications. So the government is always looking for a way to balance the public health response with um, mitigating economic uh, collapse and the consequences of that. So this is the time for us to start to relax and allow, we're not relaxing because we want the outbreak to continue, but we're relaxing it simply because we want to put an injection back into the economy. All right. Sounds uh, like a valid reason to many Nigerians who, you know, actually protested against the lockdowns in the country. Now, uh, we hear that uh, with increased testing, we're beginning to see reduced percentage of uh, positive cases. Well, what are the reasons for this? So that's in keeping with what I just said. Um, we've, Lagos is really, has a very expanded, um, deep um, testing strategy. We test at our isolation centers. We've gone into the community, we're testing right down at local government area, and we're looking for the footprint of this virus across different uh, communities in Lagos State. And what we've noticed as we do this deep dive is that the number of positive cases out of every 100 is gradually reducing what we call the positivity rate. That again suggests to us that we've, we've peaked or we're passing our peak and that the virus is no longer finding vulnerable people to infect. Um, so this is one of the confidence building um, observations. Lagos has based its outbreak response purely on data. It's been a data-driven response in Lagos. We collect data from many uh, sources and it's that data that has helped us to refine and define our policies towards the outbreak response in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. If you don't test, you won't know what's going on. And when you see, the more you test, the more you'll find. And uh, when we say the more you find, we'll mean, we mean the more we'll find of what the virus is doing. Uh, so is the virus still raging out there or is the virus slowing down because of certain attributes of your community? So without a testing strategy, it's almost impossible to define the profile of the outbreak. But luckily in Lagos, we've, we had a head start and we were able to test almost from the word go and we've expanded our testing profile. We're doing over a thousand tests a day. And that is really giving us the confidence to make the decisions that we're making in government. You just spoke about testing strategy. And uh, I, would, I would like to ask, what other strategies have been employed in Lagos and Nigeria as a whole that are different to say South Africa, where the numbers are still on the rise? So our strategies um, have, have been multi-factorial. Uh, From the beginning, we, we, we deployed what's called the strict containment strategy. So anybody that was found to be positive or the contacts of, of positives were aggressively contained either in isolation centers um, or in uh, institutions. Um, then once we reached our community transmission phase, it then became impossible to uh, confine people into isolation centers. And then we rolled out what we call our uh, home-based care. And we deployed uh, digital technology through telemedicine and our primary healthcare platform to ensure that people in community with the virus, uh, especially those with the asymptomatic to mild profile of the disease, were kept in conducive environments in the community uh, while we um, reserved our isolation centers for people who had more moderate to severe disease uh, and needed more medical attention, or especially those that had organ failure like respiratory failure, who then needed uh, oxygen therapy and other kinds of supportive uh, interventions. Yeah. So we've, we've divided our treatment approach into two-pronged home-based and more intensive medical care at our isolation facilities and also uh, deployed digital technology. 
Of course, beyond that, we've had a very aggressive public health campaign. We, I don't think there's anybody in Lagos that doesn't know about COVID-19 and the attributes of COVID-19 and what to do uh, to protect yourself and also what to do to help and manage your COVID should you become uh, symptomatic. So, you know, all these attributes put together has helped us to define a well-structured uh, Lagos state response um, centered on the principle of extensive testing. Mm. In one of the strategies you just mentioned, uh, you, you spoke on community. Uh, what more do you think the Lagos state government can do to engage the community in uh, preventing the spread of COVID-19? Well, I don't think there's any much more we can do. We've done everything. We've used billboards, we've gone into the community, television, radio, uh, community meetings, we've uh, generated documentaries, we've skits, all kinds of information. We've gone through the royal, the royal fathers, we've gone through the local government uh, authorities. So, I mean, if you, if you are in Lagos and you haven't heard the full details of COVID, I would be very surprised. And I, you know, of course, there are still skeptics that think that COVID doesn't exist, but that's not because we haven't given them the information. They're just skeptics and that's, there's nothing more we can do about that until COVID actually touches you or your, or your family member. You may remain a disbeliever, but the facts are out there and anybody who is watching television or radio or informed will know that COVID is indeed a real, a real scenario. Mm. Indeed, and well done for all the efforts the Lagos State Government uh, is putting in there uh, regarding uh, sensitizing Nigerians on uh, how real this virus is and how we can uh, stay safe. Uh, moving on now, what are your thoughts around uh, the uh, controversial hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID-19 patients or prevention? So we had a strategy to test uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine earlier on. We had rolled out an elaborate plan to, to, to conduct a clinical trial. And then we were hit with the bombshell from WHO and from various leading journalists, journal, journals around the world, medical journals, that cast a significant doubt on one, the safety of chloroquine and two, the efficacy of chloroquine. And that really disrupted and destabilized our attempt to carry out a clinical trial because if the WHO are saying that chloroquine is dangerous, you know, we would receive a significant amount of opposition and um, loss of credibility if we are Lagos State. Why is Lagos State uh, opposing, you know, the, the, the announcements of the World Health Organization? So it was difficult for us to overcome this obstacle. You know, once you've said something, it, it's difficult to retract it, even though the WHO later came around to retract what they said. And those articles that went out in leading medical journals were also retracted. Uh, we've used chloroquine in Africa for a long time. We know its safety profile. We use chloroquine in other immunological diseases. Um, the principle behind the efficacy of chloroquine is a sound based on scientific knowledge about how chloroquine works. What was lacking is a well-designed clinical trial that would once and for all either um, confirm its utility or refute its utility. Some of the principles of the, or, or the properties of chloroquine are it has an anti-inflammatory effect. And, you know, COVID is an inflammatory disease. So whether it's effective against the virus or not, it's possible that this drug or its analogs would have an anti-inflammatory beneficial impact on people. You give it to, especially if you give it to them early on in the infection. We've had anecdotal evidence that chloroquine has some effect, but we can't say that because as doctors and scientists, we can only make pronunciations around well-designed clinical trials that show benefit. So in a nutshell, our attempt to roll out a clinical trial is still on in Lagos, but it has been severely, um, um, we've received some severe um, setbacks because of some of the propaganda or some of the uh, announcements that have been made in the global press and from the WHO, but we're still on track 
hopefully before the end of the outbreak, we might be able to generate some information around the utility of chloroquine or its analogs. And we're looking forward to that. Now, you just talked about uh, just how much the Lagos State Government has done to enlighten people. You talked about billboards and uh, using several other mediums to get the information across uh, to Nigerians. But what can be done about the observation that information dissemination is still much a problem and made social media misinformation, especially with people thinking that COVID-19 is an elite problem and you have a Minister of Information coming out to, to debunk this. So what can be done about this? So, um, you know, misinformation is a way of life nowadays with the advent of social media and rapid transmission of information. You know, we are constantly, you know, refuting misinformation and educating the public about what we believe is right and what is wrong. You know, we have a very aggressive social media strategy, um, not just around COVID, but in general around health, um, so that we can drive this new way of, or influence this new way of communication, especially amongst the youth. So wherever we can, we debunk um, misinformed um, uh, propagation of information. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because by the time you've done your research, the information has gone wide and far. But nonetheless, we are able to counter a lot of this misinformation by uh, an, an equal and opposite uh, strategy towards uh, curtailing the impact of misinformation. We use the social media in two ways. One is, first of all, to um, keep the public informed on a virtual basis. And secondly, uh, uh, and often in scenarios like this, to, to debunk uh, misleading information or propaganda that may be out there to either uh, cause confusion or to uh, undermine a strategy or simply just mis mischievous uh, attempts from members of society. Mm. I know that right now, globally, in fact, you know, agencies that are concerned with health are faced with enormous pressure to deliver and, you know, get things done. But uh, let's take a breather and find out uh, uh, from your end, what are the key challenges your department is facing uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and how are you responding to it? Okay, are we, can I take that question? Oh, you want me to come again? No, I thought you were going on a break, but No, sorry. I, I was asking you. Yes. <laughs> so, um, of course, you know, we're living in an environment that we describe as low to middle income with weak health infrastructure, weak education systems, um, lots of um, urban chaos, you know, poorly designed expansion of cities. Um, poor access to sanitation, power, uh, uh, a lot of um, um, deficit, deficits in waste management. So these are some of the issues that we're grappling with in even in the context of a COVID-19 outbreak. So this is a transmissible agent. The way to interrupt transmission of a highly infectious agent is to improve your hygiene, improve your design of, how, of homes that we live in, to have access to water, fresh air, and easy movement through a city, um, good transportation systems that don't um, put you at risk, uh, good school designs, good hospital designs, uh, good um, supportive uh, policies, and then, you know, the human resources to deliver your, your policies so, and, and your strategies. So for health, we have a severe deficit in human resources for health. This is caused by um, a shortage or, or inadequate production of health personnel. And then once we produce them, many of them um, leave the country for greener pastures. So Nigeria is constantly in a deficit of health, human resources for health. So these are some of the major problems that we are encountering, and it makes us less effective when we're trying to tackle a pandemic of this nature, whether it's airborne or waterborne, the principles are the same. So while we're trying to overcome COVID at the moment, we're very mindful of these underlying risk factors that we need to pay attention to over the midterm to long term, so that we're making Lagos a mega city, a more resilient 
environment and less uh, vulnerable to these kinds of biological and biosecurity threats. Fantastic. I would like to check in with you to get feedback on the uh, uh, spike, possibly, maybe, uh, regarding uh, COVID-19 as churches have been reopened, restaurants have been reopened, uh, as well as uh, schools for students to write exams. You know, what's, what's the case figure been like? So we, we haven't observed a spike. Um, uh, as we've slowly opened up the economy, we've been watching very carefully. As I said, our response is data-driven. Uh, we thought we might get a slight um, extension of the, of the plateau phase, but we're not really expecting a spike in Lagos uh, because of the attributes that I described earlier. We believe we've peaked and that we have a significant amount of herd immunity operating in Lagos. And therefore, as we relax the economy, um, yes, we might see a little bit of sustained transmission, but we don't believe that this is going to um, um, culminate in a, in a spike or what we've observed around the world as uh, second waves. Fantastic. I, I, I like that you mentioned that we're now at the stage where we're seeing herd immunity. And I mean, schools open, churches open. How about entertainment centers like uh, the cinema, for instance? When do you think uh, this might be open for people to, you know, also come out and, uh, you know, relax? Has it been indoors for, for a while now? So when we relax the economy, our first priority is to relax segments of society that are dependent on um, generation of livelihood. So we don't want to relax the economy and, you know, throw caution to the wind. So we're opening up the necessary attributes of our economy, which are, you know, schools, uh, markets, shops, uh, industry, so that people who are engaged in these forms of livelihood can return to their economic base. Um, entertainment, although it is a form of economy, it's also entertainment can be associated with increased uh, risk to transmission. For example, people in crowded enclosed environments would create uh, environments that uh, possibly could exacerbate transmission to those that are still vulnerable. So we are a bit more cautious with opening um, entertainment uh, spaces that or entertainment activities that are uh, confined spaces where large numbers of people may congregate in a room that has poor ventilation and you're not able to uh, exercise uh, a reasonable degree of social distancing. So while that will come soon, as we observe the impact of what we've done already in terms of relaxing the economy, before we relax uh, social activities that are confined in, in spaces, we just want to observe the effect of relaxing uh, the lockdown um, attributes that we've just uh, talked about. Mm. That sounds like good news for a lot of Nigerian youth uh, listening right now. And just before I let you go, I'd like to ask you about the cost of care. I'd like you to uh, you know, address the recent misunderstanding in this regard regarding cost of care for COVID-19 patients. I don't think there's any misunderstanding. I just think people are surprised at the cost of care. You know, um, to put together a statewide response of this magnitude is, is not a cheap thing by any stretch of the imagination. So anywhere else in the world, we've done our comparative analysis and it costs a lot of money to, to mount a, in an emergency response where you're building, you're erecting new buildings, you are buying a lot of equipment, you are doing a lot of training, you're buying a lot of consumables, you're doing public awareness campaigns, you're making sure that everybody's informed, you are carrying out research, you are paying extra amounts of money to people, to doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals to put their lives at risk. So this is not the ordinary activity that we conduct in the medical environment or in the economy of any country. So it's going to come with a cost and every cost has to be factored. So when you're talking about delivering care to a patient, you know, a good economist will look at all the attributes of mounting that response. And when we put all those factors together, uh, the lay population may think, oh, well, it's just a bed and, you know, giving patients some, some tablets and measuring their, their temperature. No, it's not. You know, it, how did you arrive at the diagnosis? How, how much did it cost you to build a, an elaborate laboratory? 
how much did it cost you to um, go out there to find people to test? How much did it cost you to build a new hospital? How much did it cost you to power that hospital? What, what is the extra funding that you need to pay to health professionals to come forward and be trained and to start to look after patients who, if they catch the infection from those patients, their lives will be at risk? How much does it cost to buy all this uh, public uh, personal protection equipment? You know, what you see as the white space suits and all the, uh, all the masks and the face masks. And how much is it to set up intensive care units to treat complications in, in COVID-19? You know, the general public just needs to understand that government has spent a lot of money in the interest of safeguarding the population. And governments around the world are spending a lot of money and the economies are flat and st you still have to find the money to, to, to mount a response. So economists will put all this together and, and show the cost benefit of, of the response. And when you factor each and every one of these components into the response, and the response essentially is, how much does it cost to look after a patient with COVID-19? And how much does it cost to keep Lagos safe? from the ravages of, of COVID-19. And that's the Would job of health that? economists. And it is our duty to understand, um, and it is our responsibility. If the community did not think that we're mindful of how we spend our money, then I don't think that they would appreciate us being in government. Commissioner, so just for I, clarity's sake, you've been speaking about uh, uh, the cumulative cost for care, not uh, uh, for an individual COVID-19 patient, isn't it? Yes, I okay. mean the the whole response has a cost, and then that boils down to the, the to to the management of a patient to make sure that the patient doesn't die. Fantastic, and that's unfortunately all we can take at this time. Lagos State Commissioner for Health, uh, right here, has been with us on the breakfast, uh, speaking with us on the updates of COVID nineteen. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today.